So um, we will go ahead and get started. We have been on a tremendous journey through Lent um, and the fierce landscapes. And I wanted to just start this morning session kind of with a recap of some of the territory that we've been on before we jump into uh, the Stations of the Cross. And um, we started with Dick, um, who used Mark Roscoe as a lens to talk about cataphatic and apophatic and the context of that and these journeys that we can do internally, but also these journeys that we can do externally as well. Good morning, Dick. Welcome. I'm just doing a recap on apophatic and cataphatic. Oh, and I'm thankful I can say the words. <laughs> oh. You got a full house, Casey. You got a full house. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> we certainly crescendoed to this point and had amazing people that have shared with us throughout this series. So, in our second one, um, Lori Van Balen, who's the sister in law of Mary Van Balen, and it was a book club conversation that we were having, or I'm sorry, a film conversation that we were having when Mary shared about the work that Lori was doing through Columbus Crossing Borders. And in that presentation, had a beautiful account of um, art merging with advocacy and the work that Lori and her team has done with Columbus Crossing Borders. And I do encourage you after um, this call or sometime through the week, um, check out the Columbus Crossing Borders website. They've launched a new site which has an interactive page on it. Um, an interactive gallery view. So, and then on March 7th, we had the Reverend Dr. R. Drew Smith, who walked us through the reckoning of racial justice and equity, and um, a powerful account of introduction of how um, Dick and Dr. Smith became friends at Yale Divinity School. And um, there, he shared with us just the importance of presence and of engaging in conversation. So, and especially difficult conversations. And then we had Dr. Pat Regola, our very own, um, who took us on a journey, a Buddhist pilgrimage journey in Japan. And this was a part of her dissertation work. And I know Pat, you're on here and thank you for that. It was a part of her dissertation work and we got to see images of the different sites on the pilgrimage and the Buddhist. Um, communities throughout that, which were incredibly diverse. That was one of the things that moved me most about that. Um, just seeing the urban landscapes as well as the um, monasteries in the mountains. So, and then last week, um, I know those of you who were there with us, I I'm still stirring from last week's video um, with Malcolm Cochran and on Requiem, which was an account on genocide. And um, we have the recording of the video for those of you that weren't able to be there, but Malcolm, again, is working on a new website similar to, similar to Lori Van Balen, and it will be launched and showing on his website soon. So we are at our final station in our journey in these fierce landscapes, and today I'm going to talk about um, the Stations of the Cross, and um, I'm going to be doing it through the lens of the Palestinian journey, the Palestinian Via Dolorosa. And um, this, this experience really started out of in 2017 when I was a student at MTSO, the Methodist Theological School of Ohio, and went on my cross-cultural immersion trip to Israel-Palestine. And it was an absolute phenomenal opportunity. There were 18 students and two alumni. One of those alumni was my mother. <laughs> so it was an incredible trip that we were able to take together. And um, the tour, the journey was led by three MTSO professors. Um, first was Reverend Dr. Campin, uh, Reverend Dr. John Campin, and he um, is a professor at MTSO as well as um, Hebrew Union Seminary in Cincinnati. And he's an eminent scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament. And his specialization is in the Synoptic Gospels. So on this journey, we went to the site, we went to Qumran, the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Dr. Campin was able to give us firsthand account 
of really the discovery and research around the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it was absolutely fascinating. Um, the other professor was Dr. Ryan Schellenberg, and these are all people who are very familiar to Missy right now. So, um, and I, I wonder, is he teaching your Greek class, Dr. Schellenberg? Uh, Shel yes, he is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Shelly, yeah. <laughs> so, and he's um, an expert on Paul and is um, focuses on social history of early Christianity. So Luke and Acts and the parables of Jesus. And then we had um, Dr. Yvonne Zimmerman, and she's a friend of this church, I think has been on some panels with Dick in the past. Um, and she's currently the academic um, associate academic dean and associate professor of Christian ethics. Her focus is on feminist theory um, in gender and sexuality studies and social theory and human trafficking. So it really was the dream team that we were going on this trip with. And so I tee that up just because it was an experience in deep history and study of the area. Um, we did a lot of, went to a lot of the digs and sites which Dr. Don, John Campen was an expert in. And then um, Dr. Schellenberg really talked about kind of the modernization of society as Jesus during um, early, the early AD time period, late BC, early, or er, kind of around Jesus's birth and what that looked like. And then Dr. Zimmerman really dove into the justice aspect of this, which is where we're gonna be talking about the contemporary version of the cross. So I will dive into some pictures here that I put together and they start with, let's see, Let's get it in. Okay. So I wanted to jump in. This, you were looking at the Sea of Galilee. And this was on May 27th, 2007. We aborted a boat. <laughs> that um, It was a bit of a tourist attraction, but it was a way for us to get out on the sea. And the boat that we were on, it was one that was designed and would have been typical during the time of Jesus's era. And you can see students sitting around the perimeter. Um, all the way on the left is Dr. Schellenberg. Dr. Campen is next to him. And then Dr. Zimmerman is in the white tank top there. And then those are classmates and students moving forward from there. A beautiful, beautiful day to be on the Sea of Galilee and a really offered the opportunity to get a perspective of its size um, and the topography around the Sea of Galilee. So when we hear stories of Jesus walking up or down, we could definitely see that from this vantage point. It was very um, kitschy, the tour. So um, a group of Americans and a couple Canadians boarded the boat and they proceeded to raise the American flag. So here's a picture of the American flag. So here we are in Israel um, area. We have the Israeli flag, but they're also raising the flag of the United States, which was a little bit strange. And then um, they start playing contemporary Christian music. And they start playing um, a modern song, How Great Is Our God? How Great Is Our God? Some of you might be aware of this song. And it, it was just a little bit strange. And so here's a picture of us on the boat. Um, that's me in the middle, my mom on the right hand side, and then a classmate, Kevin, he's a UU pastor in Northeastern Ohio. Um, so enjoying the day. And it was at about midway through the tour, we started looking out over the mountain. And if you look closely at this picture, you can see where the sea ends and there's a plume of smoke. And so we are on this boat with the American flag raised, hearing the songs of how great is our God. And we ask, you know, what's going on in the distance? And our guide says, well, that's Syria over there. Oh. And knowing enough about what was happening in Syria, um, it was smoke from the bombings that were taking place in Syria. So there was this juxtaposition of us sitting on this boat, hearing this music, um, this beautiful day, and with end sight, um, we were seeing people dying, um, people being injured, and a country in true 
unrest just over the mountain. So, um, and so that's really what I wanted to use as the framework to step into this journey today. So um, many of you are aware of the Stations of the Cross through the Via Della Rosa. And um, we, one of the stops that we had was with the Sibyl community. And so we're gonna be using this book to journey through the contemporary way of the cross. And I use that story as a way um, to talk about kind of the modernization of the Stations of the Cross and what they could look like in our life now. And um, the Sibyl Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center was an incredible place that we visited. It was um, a community of Palestinian Christians. And I will read this out loud, but their mission was to strive towards theological liberation through instilling the Christian faith in the daily lives of those who suffer under occupation, violence, injustice, and discrimination. And their vision is they're local Christians inspired by the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, and they stand for the oppressed, work for, the ju work for justice, and engage in peace building. So I'm going to do a little background on um, the Stations of the Cross through the Via Della Rosa in Jerusalem, and then we're going to dive into um, these contemporary Stations of the Cross from the Palestinian perspective. And depending on time, we may only get through three of the Stations of the Cross, but I my plan is to leave you with resources so that um, so that we you can use these in the coming week in Holy Week. Um, the Stations of the Cross are typically done not on Palm Sunday, but we are doing them on Palm Sunday as an introduction, but um, starting on Wednesday of Holy Week and moving into Monday, Thursday and Good Friday. And ideally with there's 14 stations, let's see if my next slide, hopefully you can see these. So these are the traditional stations of the cross and we're going to be going through the first three of the contemporary stations. Um, and I'll just read through these briefly so that we have a context of where we're going. Um, so the first station, Jesus is condemned to die. The second station, Jesus carries his cross. Third, Jesus falls for the first time. Fourth, Jesus meets his mother. Fifth, Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus carry his cross. Sixth, Veronica wipes Jesus's face. Seventh, Jesus falls the second time. Eighth, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. Ninth, Jesus falls the third time. Tenth, Jesus is stripped. Eleventh, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Twelfth, Jesus dies on the cross. 13th, Jesus is taken down from the cross. 14th, Jesus is laid in the tomb and after the third day is raised from the dead. So we'll, here's some pictures of um, my journey when I, in 2017 through the Via Della Rosa. And this is an image of what it looked like. It's really narrow passageways. And you can see some of the signs. There's a green sign on the left, which is in Arabic. And there's other signs throughout the journey. And it's just these little medallions that mark the stations of the cross as you're passing through. Oh. Um, and this is one, there's merchants and markets that are in this small pathway. So you're passing through these areas where you can buy spices or scarves. Um, and souvenirs, um, and then move on to the next um, station of the cross. This right here is um, station number five, and this is um, Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus carry his cross, and it said right here that Jesus's hand touched the wall here, and there's a plaque around it, um, and there's different studies of whether, you know, a hand could actually change the shape of, um, of stone, but that's how it was set up. So you can come up and touch the stone where Jesus's hand was. And then it finishes in the church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this church, um, 
is where stations, let's see, where stations um, 10 through 14 are. And it encloses the crucifixion, the death, and the burial sites of Jesus. Oh. And then it's a Greek Orthodox church. So it's very ornate. It's a little, um, it was strange for me just to have the icons and images and everything, but um, it's, it's a holy place. And you really, even with the people around, this is an image that I took off the internet. All of my images had a lot of people in them, um, but you are given some privacy as you walk up to the altar and can have a moment at the sacred place, which um, is the Hill of Calvary in the area where it was built. Um, so we'll transition from here to um, the contemporary stations of the cross. And again, these are the stations that are written by the Seville Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center. And I'll go through these stations in similar fashion that I did with the traditional stations. And there'll be some images and some reading. And um, I may call on individuals. If you're not interested in reading from the, uh, from the screen, you can just say pass. Um, or if you are, just unmute yourself and you can start reading. I don't want it just to be a narration of me throughout this process, but really something um, to be invitational to us as we enter into this Holy Week period. So um, the contemporary stations of the cross as laid out by the Sibyl community. First, the Nakba in 1948. Second, refugees. Third, 1967 occupation. Fourth, settlements. Fifth, stress and humiliation. Sixth, solidarity. Seventh, home demolitions. Eighth, women against the occupation. Ninth, checkpoints. Tenth, bureaucratic oppression. Eleventh, Gaza. Twelfth, the wall. Thirteenth, the loss of Jerusalem. Fourteenth, what will the fourteenth station be? And as we enter into this period of the Stations of the Cross, um, keep in mind these were designed as a pilgrimage. And um, a pilgrimage for people to do if they were present in Jerusalem um, and also a pilgrimage for people to do um, leading up to Holy Week. So this inscription is in the front part of the book and it says in the old city we read the inscriptions Pause where a plaque on the wall reminds us that Jesus falls under the weight of the cross over and over again. In the refugee camp, we read the writing on the wall, the stencil, stenciled images of martyrs, graffiti, dusty posters, calls to action, cries of pain over and over again. Station one, the Nakba of 1948. Missy, I wonder you're the image that is showing most present if you might read that for us. Sure. I'm opening meditation. Just as Jesus was condemned to die, so the actions of 1948 passed a death sentence on more than 400 historic Palestinian villages that were completely destroyed across the country. We remember the pain and of losing community, family networks, and a sense of place. We open our eyes to the initial devastation caused by the founding of the state of Israel, a devastation that has never received acknowledgement. And we hold these people and their memories in our thoughts. And the image to the right is a community that was um, a part of this destruction. So you can see how there were walls 
I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Misty, I wonder if you might mute yourself again. Um, so you can see, and these were communities that you've seen just driving through the countryside. So where there was some rubble, you could see structures in existence of community and neighborhoods before, um, but there was overgrowth and no longer people living there or rooftops in many of the areas. Micah Pegg, would you read Psalm 69? Scripture, Psalm 69, verses one through three. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying my throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. I'm going to read a poem called Death Sentence by Sulafa Ijawi. At night, orders came to soldiers to destroy our lovely village, Zeta. Zeta, bride of trees, of blooming tulips, spark of the winds. The soldiers came in the dark while the sons of the village, the trees and fields and flower buds clung to Zeta, hugging her for shelter. Orders demand that all of you depart Zeta. Zeta will be destroyed before night ends. But we held tight, chanting. Zeta is the land, the heart of the land, and we, her people, are its branches. That's how people fall. A few moments of resistance, so Zeta remains an internal embrace across the nights. In moments, she was rubble. Not a single bread oven remained. Men and stones were pasted and powdered by enemy tractors, scattered forever in the light of the impossible. Now in the evenings, in the song of our wind, Zeta arises, igniting its scarlet spark upon the plains, and by morning, Zeta returns to the fields as tulips do. Night is morning in Zeta. Night is morning. In our closing prayer for station one, although the dark night of oppression has been long, the dawn of justice will shine. May God work through people of goodwill to bring about a genuine peace based on justice and mercy so that forgiveness and reconciliation will prevail for all people of Palestine. Amen. And I invite you to take a few moments for personal reflection on the lives that were lived in such villages, how they changed in 1948, and how that change is affected for the rest of their lives, those who were uprooted, either as adults or children. So we'll just take a moment of silence. Station two is refugees. Our opening meditation is this. Jesus carried the weight of the cross. Jesus carried the weight of the cross. The weight of the cross borne by the Palestinians falls heavy on the refugees. Just under 2 million within the West Bank and Gaza and over 2.8 million outside for whom the dispossession of 1948 and 1967 are a daily reality. Like Jesus, they must continue to walk the way of suffering, burdened by the cause of their pain. Fred or Carol, do you want to read this piece? Refugees, the Palestinian refugee crisis originates in the 1948 creation of the State of Israel and the later war and occupation of 1967. The war of 1948 caused at least 750,000 
Palestinians to flee to the neighboring countries of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, with the same fate befalling 460,000 people in the wake of the 1967 war. In 1949, UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, was set up to carry out direct relief and works programs for the Palestinian refugees. The agency began operations on May 1st, 1950. In the absence of a solution to the Palestine refugee problem, the General Assembly has repeatedly renewed UNRWA's mandate. Currently, according to 2010 UNRWA figures, there are 778,993 registered refugees in the West Bank and 1,106,195 in the Gaza Strip and a further 2,881,482 registered in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. Living conditions for refugees living in UNRWA camps are very difficult. And for those outside of the West Bank and Gaza Strip residency, residency and citizenship rights are also an issue. Israel continues to deny the right of return to the refugees and resolving the refugee question will be a key part of any negotiated settlement to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Thank you. So the UNRWA, while we were there, we had the opportunity to go to a refugee camp outside of Bethlehem. And um, the poems and writings around here talks about the art that is present and there are murals on many of the walls in this refugee camp. And as um, the individuals stand in solidarity with one another and this particular mural, um, these four gentlemen who are depicted here, their names are written above in Arabic, um, were killed um, in the refugee camp um, by Israeli militia. And um, the last one is who is next. And so there is a sense of fear in these camps. Um, while there's um, community, um, we met some of the families that live there and the individual that gave us um, the tour had lived in the refugee camp and outside the refugee camp, um, but talked about just the strength of neighbor in the camp, but also the fear that exists within there. And then here's another mural and it's kind of, a reverse of roles where it's the the person, um, the potential refugee who's kneeling down and that's the military official who's being frisked. So, and what that would look to have someone who is unarmed and um, just wearing normal clothes, um, frisking someone who this is demonstrating who has cause and reason for being frisked. Um, I wonder if there's a volunteer that wants to unmute and read Psalm 42. Catherine, it looks like you're unmuting. I'm unmuting. Okay. Um, can may we read this responsibly by whole verse? Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went how I long and led them in procession to the house of God. House with glad shouts and songs, songs of thanksgiving, a multitude, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, 
my help and my, my God. My soul, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from the Mount Mizer. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully? Because the enemy oppresses me. As With a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. A reading of reflection. From the perspective of the Palestinian, the beautiful Psalm 42 can be used as the real cry of a refugee. The psalmist apparently has been forced out of his homeland, living as a refugee in Jordan or Lebanon. He remembers happier times. His friends and neighbors, the worshiping congregations, especially the great feasts when people celebrated together with excitement, with songs and praises to God. He reminisces about his own participation in these joyous festivities. As he recalls the past, the psalmist is aware of his painful present expelled from his country, deprived of his own home, living with grief and despair, frustration and anguish. The turbulent waters and the stormy seas represent the troubles and disasters that he has experienced. His memories of Palestine are beautiful and exhilarating, but they make the present harder to bear. His only hope is in God. Trusting God is the only way to a better future. Hope in God is the only medicine and cure for a depressed spirit. So he will not succumb to despair. God will vindicate his rights. God will come to his help and bring him salvation. Naeem Atik is the author of that reflection. In our concluding prayer for this station is compassionate God, our refuge and defense. We remember before you those made refugees for so long in the camps of the West Bank in Gaza, of Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and those dispersed throughout the world. Strengthen the will of the international community to work for their repatriation and compensation for the sake of the one who is made a refugee, for the sake of the one who was made a refugee and now lives and reigns forever. Amen. And I invite you to take a few moments for reflection on the lives of those who fled their homes in 1948 and 1967 and still long to return. Station three, the 1967 occupation. John Soderbergh, could I ask you to read? Maybe. Certainly. I gotta move a little closer so I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can get uh, 1967 occupation. 1967 was the year of the six day war during which the, lo the Israeli military took by force the, Jor the Jordanian controlled West Bank and the Egyptian controlled Gaza Strip. As in 1948, the occupation took place with the destruction of many villages and expropriation of homes and communities. Approximately 460,000 Palestinians were expelled, including some 
175,000 registered refugees from the 1948 conflict who were forced to flee for a second time. Soon after the conquest, a census was taken. Those absent from their homes on that day, whether visiting family or attending school outside of the country, were not allowed to return as residents, separating them permanently from their families and homeland. The occupation of 1967 continues today. Contrary to international law and the continued is, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, yes, sorry, con uh, contrary to international law and the continued Israeli land grab and subjugation of the Palestinian people by way of settlement building, closure, bureaucratic harassment, and military control further contravenes the way an occupier is legally obliged to treat a population under its control. I wonder if we might have two volunteers on here, one for the opening meditation and one for Psalm 31. Like Craig? Yeah, I can do the opening meditation. Great. As we consider the occupation of the West Bank in Gaza and reflect on Jesus falling for the first time, we think of the second blow in the, to the Palestinian community to lose their homeland to others was a devastating loss. Their life under occupation was and is yet another cross to bear. It is a cross that has lasted since 1967. Palestinians have no country to call their own, no passport, no proper place in the world of nations. The landscape is carved with barbed wire, checkpoints, settlements, and walls. We pray for understanding and determination to confront this illegal occupation and name its evils. Does someone want to read Psalm 31? I'll, I'll read it. Okay. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind, passed out of mind like the one who is dead. I have become like the broken vessel. I hear, for I hear the whispering of many, terror all around. As they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life, I trust in you, O Lord, I say. You are my God. And we'll conclude Asian 3 with this poem. And I'll read the bolded part, and then you're welcome to join in for the unbolded part. Or I'm sorry, reverse that. All of us say the bolded part together, and then I'll read the unbolded. So, oh God, hear my prayer. For I live in misery and darkness. They usurped our country. They partitioned it and robbed it. They distorted truth and suppressed freedom. They plowed our fields and planted them with our bodies. They uprooted our villages and placed them with their homes. In your name, O oh God, they tortured me and dispersed my people. In your name, they ravaged and prevailed. O oh God, hear my prayer. They defiled our holy places and violated our sanctuaries. They crucified our humanity and trampled on our aspirations. They shut down our universities and surrounded our schools to silence our young and usurp our rights. O oh God, we know that you stand by us. For you are just and you are fair. We are determined. O oh God, 
to regain our rights. For we are confident that you shall support us because we have faith in your justice. So, and I know I'm the timekeeper and we're a little bit over time, um, but here's a look at the totality of the Stations of the Cross, which we started with. And um, certainly as we went through this, um, it was reminiscent of what Lori Van Balen shared, you know, whether the plight of the Somalian refugee or the South or Central American refugee. Um, also um, what Pat shared and just kind of movement through the different stations. And then um, with Malcolm last week, kind of these displaced voices and these sounds that we hear from people who had community and, and no longer um, are in that same area. So um, as we move into Palm Sunday worship, I invite you um, after worship and throughout this week to engage with the Stations of the Cross, um, knowing that this journey of pilgrimage will continue for each of us, but that this is a way to kind of take that of Holy Week and move with it and move to the cross with Christ and to be transformed through this process. So um, any final comments um, or pieces before we conclude? I know I didn't leave us too much time for discussion. Thank you, Debbie. Daisy, we want to say thank you for this day and for the, the series. Uh, you really held us together with some, some um, disparate and yet in many ways interconnected themes that give us fierce landscapes and a different understanding of that. I want to say there's a, there's a personal connection with Trinity Church and Naeem, uh, um, who is one of the founders of Sibyl. I got a letter from Episcopal Peace Fellowship um, asking us to uh, host during General Convention of 2006 to host the, the award ceremony for uh, the award Peace, Peace uh, Makers Award that, that uh, was being given that year to Naeem Akatif, who's an Episcopal priest from, um, from a Palestinian Christian from um, uh, St. George's College in Jerusalem, I believe that's his, his sort of base, home base now. And, but he's one of the founders of Seville. I didn't know anything about him. I knew a little about St. George's College and I knew uh, a little about Peace, Episcopal Peace Fellowship, but Madeline Trichelle also received that award some years before, and it was quite a big deal. In fact, I think even with Gene Robinson preaching at Integrity and Catherine Jefford Shorey being elected two days later in our nave, I think the one event that, that I feel the most gratitude for was hosting Episcopal Peace Fellowship and meeting mm -hmm. Nakatim Atif. I will say, Anaim Atif, I will say that I got um, two calls and a very uh, stern note from rabbinical colleagues in town. And I, as you, I think you all know, and certainly you know, Stacy, that I have worked very hard at Jewish Christian relations, very hard. And, um, and I value uh, contact with Jewish friends and with rabbinical colleagues greatly. Um, and there was an upset about Nikteem Atif being, being awarded and about host, uh, Trinity hosting it. And it really forced me to come to grips with how do I, uh, I had a teacher at school who said, uh, the problem of standing in the middle of the road is you have equal chance of being hit by cars going in either direction. And, you know, as, as in, in a way, um, you know, the, the history of the United States, in some ways, the history of, of Christianity and the history of the Anglican Communion has been a kind of moderating in the middle of the road, you know, picture, picture Jimmy Carter bringing Begin and Sadat together and that sort of thing. It's hard work and we have to, we have to come to grips, I think, as Christians with kind of how we strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being as we promise and how we do it with eyes wide open and telling, telling a story that is, um, is multivaliant. So uh, the, the Sabil message is a powerful message, mm -hmm. but I do, do encourage us to, to keep our eyes wide open and to say our prayers for the peace of Jerusalem. I know that sounds like a very mod overly moderate thing to say, but um, I don't know what else we can do in Holy Week as we look at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, a continuous injustice and a struggle. 
uh, the other thing is uh, Yossi Halibi, beautiful letters, letters to a Palestinian friend is worth worth taking a look at as well. I, I encourage you to take a look at that little, it's in paperback now, that little book by Yossi Halibi. Um, so that I offered you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you for being a part of this series and um, for joining us. And I think we can conclude by saying amen. Um, amen. Amen. And happy Easter. Yes. Happy Easter. Happy Palm Sunday and see you in worship. Bye. Bye.